Hello, I'm Aloysius. I'm the owner of Haunted Harbor Tours. I tell international ghost stories here on YouTube. I also own a ghost tour company in the city of Annapolis, Maryland. And if you come to Annapolis, I will take you around the city and tell you true horror stories. Based on true history, the ghosts are all researched and verified. I don't waste your time with folklore. But here on YouTube, I will tell a folklore story or an accurate history story. Whatever I happen to find, what I search for are the best stories from around the world. And I'm really excited about this one, to be quite honest with you. This one is like a fairy tale. However, the history is 100% real. Everything in this story is verifiable. And even, I mean, there are small details that we can't really be sure of. And I'll talk about those as we go. A real fairy tale is tragic and twisted and bleak. This is like the real thing. The grim fairy tales where princesses, kings, peasants, it doesn't matter who the story is about, they're all gonna get theirs in the end. And even if they don't deserve it, everybody's gonna suffer and uh, you'll never get a happy ever after. And that's exactly what we have in this video today. But I'm gonna begin it as though it were a fairy tale. I think we all know how it begins. Once upon a time, 1446, in a far, far land, a place called France, a princess is born beautiful Princess Charlotte. But Princess Charlotte is born with a curse. You see, she is the illegitimate child of King Charles VII and his mistress, Agnes Sorel. This was a famous affair. She birthed three kids with a fourth on the way before Agnes died. And the queen knew about it the entire time. And she didn't like it, but she had to accept. After all, he was the king. The queen bore some 14 or 15 children to King Philip VII. Despite the fact it wasn't her, she loved Charlotte, and she was pretty good to her. As far as I can tell, the fact that the queen treated Charlotte with such reverence and joy, despite the fact that it's not hers, that she's the illegitimate child of her husband, this upset Charlotte's half-brother, Louis. Louis despised Agnes Sorel. Louis was furious with his father over the years, getting angrier and angrier until eventually it led to revolt. Louis was driven out of France into hiding because of the attacks. His father gave him every chance he could to be a part of the family, although Louis was not having it. While Agnes was traveling, she died. It wasn't known at the time, but modern forensic scientists say that it was mercury poisoning that did her in. Now, it is possible that she died of natural mercury poisoning because people in the past were idiots and they used it for things you really shouldn't. The Romans were famous for using it in their wines and on their plates. But Lewis took credit, claiming that he poisoned her and had her poisoned while he was in exile. Agnes Sorel died at 22 years old. Louis's revolt happened before Princess Charlotte was born. He never really knew her. He left because his father's affair well before Charlotte was ever born. Charlotte was four years old the day her mother died. I believe that's why the queen took such a fondness to her. King Charles VII wanted what was best for Charlotte. And when she was 16 years old, he reached out to a man he had in high regards, a 22-year-old man. This is the 1460s. While Charlotte was 16 years old, King Philip VII began contacting a man named Jacques de Bries and asking him to take his daughter's hand in marriage. Jacques 
is a man of very many titles. The Wikipedia page for this man is about four or five different lines of just titles. He's the lord of about six or seven different lands, each with their own palace, each with their own castle. A man of great standing over in Normandy. He owns many lands here in France. He's a duke. He's a lord. And he's a man's man. He loves the hunt. He's such a man's man and he loves the hunt so much that he writes romantic poetry about hunting. Yeah, you didn't hear that wrong. He wrote a long, long, long poem about the qualities of his best hunting dog. Ernest Hemingway is similarly considered a man's man you know, and he too was a writer. But this guy, he's like if Ernest Heming Hemingway was only writing poetry about golfing and wrote poems about how great his putter is. Now, Ernest Hemingway's wife also was nefariously angry with him for being such a pile of garbage. He, she eventually cut the electricity to all of his fans until he eventually blew his brains out in the basement. Guys like Ernest Hemingway and Joxta Breeze, they tend to be magnets for other men, like Charles VII, for instance, and they tend to be very well, well regarded among other men. They don't make the best husbands, though, and uh, there's a strong possibility a woman is going to be very neglected in that relationship. And that is exactly what happened with Princess Charlotte. You see, she spared him several children, uh, but she was not happy. He was constantly away hunting. All of the lands, all of those different castles that he owned were basically all hunting villas, and he was just constantly off chasing the fox and the deer or whatever, and he was not an attentive husband. And she was a socialite. I mean, she was raised in royalty, going to parties and celebrating. And it wasn't long until she eventually found the embrace of another man, somebody who was with her, somebody who showed up for her at these parties and got to know her. Enter Pierre de Laverne, Jacques de Brise's foster brother. According to many accounts, these two men were friends and family, but Pierre was capable of spending time with Charlotte and enjoying the same kind of socialite status that she wanted. And of course, when you're going to parties, there's wine and drink. I don't know the details of their affair. I just know the outcome of it. They were staying at one of Jacques's lands, the Chateau de Brisec, a fantastic, beautiful palace that is just elegant and gorgeous and still stands to this day. You can stay there, and I plan to. I am absolutely going to go to the Chateau, and I am going to do an investigation one day. And while Jacques was off at a hunt, these two began an affair. Jacques came home one night and he went to sleep while everybody else was partying. And he woke up to a servant who told him, you need to do something. Your wife is currently with another man. And Jacques broke into that room and we don't know the aspects of their death. We don't know exactly what he did to them. Although the ghosts kind of give us our answers. You see, it is believed that he came in with an axe and began chopping at them and whacking them with an axe, much like uh, Lizzie Borden. So he began hitting them and hitting them and hitting them with an axe. She must have been wearing green that night because the ghost of Princess Charlotte is horribly disfigured. Large holes all over her body, gashes, uh, about the shape and size of an axe, from those who have seen her ghost, at least. She's also wearing a green dress. She's known as the Green Lady at that location. There are a couple of Green Ladies that I have found, you know, women who wore green dresses on the day they died. You would think there would be severe consequences for uh, murdering the dog.
daughter of a king. But by the time this murder happened, King Charles VII was dead. King Louis XI was now king. <laughs> and obviously, King Louis XI did not like his sister. You remember Charlotte's uh, half-brother who led a revolt against her father and poisoned Agnes Sorel, Charlotte's mother? He's back, and he's now king. And so when his sister died, a, a girl he never really knew, she was born after he was exiled, and he hated the girl's mother. Why shouldn't he hate her? Despite the fact that his mother absolutely loved her, he didn't care. He didn't care at all that she was dead. Jacques was brought up on charges. He was sentenced to jail time. But King Louis, he said, eh, eh, uh, we'll just take his land. I'll let him f pay a fee. Then I'll take that land and all the money that we just took from him and I'll give it to his son, my nephew. And then he saw no consequences. He just, he just lost his lord status and he lost all of his land and all of his money, but his son now has it. And that's the end. <laughs> that's the way fairy tales end, you know? The villains, they end up fine. That's the way true history ends. Sometimes the people who deserve the most consequences don't get any. Now look, I'm a new YouTuber. I've had one successful video that, you know, has about 2,000 views right now. Aside from that, I'm sitting in nearly 200 subscribers. If you could do me an absolute solid, if you're here right now, please, please, please hit subscribe. It motivates me. It makes me feel like what I'm doing is worthwhile. Knowing that you've watched to the end, a like, a subscription, a comment down below, you know, all of those things really matter. The big YouTubers, they ask you to do it, but it's the small guys like me who need it. Let me know what you think of this fairy tale. Do you think that this sounds like something you would find in a grim fairy tale? Isn't it pretty awesome that this is true history? I got videos for you to watch. Uh, right over here is a video, and here is a video. These two videos are videos I know you're going to love, so please enjoy them, and I will catch you very soon. Thank you.